Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. For this episode of Security Matters Hawaii, I'm your host, Andrew, the security guy. And today we've got Ty Smith from Vigilance Risk Solutions joining us out of sunny San Diego, where I was just visiting and it was beautiful but cold. Ty, welcome. Thanks for having me. Did it, did it finally warm up up there? You know, it's warmer, but I think we're expecting a pretty big storm to come through this week, so uh, you may have just missed it. I got, I was on the beach at um, that, Del, I was at a, an event and it was at the Coronado and there was, I'm on the beach and they were laughing at me because I had on a hoodie and a jacket and I it was, it was freezing. Anyway, um, thanks for joining well, us. Well, in your defense, you know, you are coming from Hawaii. That's right. Well, the, I mean, uh, you can't tell from my accent, but I really, truly, my blood has run thin <laughs> after 30 years out here, I'm sure. Um, I'm I tell, sure. I tell you, Ty, go ahead and give us some. Um, I'd like to kind of give our guests a feel of, you know, your background, your history, as much as you feel like sharing. Uh, kind of bring us up through. I might, might jump in on a little bit of your career there and then, um, you know, get us up to the company that you have today. Of course. Yeah, so I was born and raised in East St. Louis, Illinois. I joined the Navy at the age of 17. Uh, I just didn't see myself really growing, growing up in East St. Louis, Illinois. So I wanted to get out and see the world, join the Navy. Was in the regular Navy for about four and a half years as a military police officer, right. criminal investigator, and an Italian translator stationed over in Sardinia, Italy, when the towers fell. Huh. And so after that, you know, I applied to SEAL training, was fortunate enough to get accepted, and made my way to Coronado, California, where I promptly started basic underwater demolition SEAL school. And fortunately, I successfully navigated that course and wound up going to an East Coast SEAL team shortly thereafter, and the rest was a blur. I had a fantastic career in the SEAL teams. I completed six combat tours to the Middle East, got a chance to operate at some really high levels, and I just had a really, really, really cool career. And at the end of my career in 2016, I knew I wanted to go into entrepreneurship, and as, as timing would have it, my timing was right because I discovered a new and rapidly growing market um, that needed very specialized skill sets in order to address a massive problem, and that problem is workplace violence. Yeah, so for sure, you and you went into grad school. Did was the Navy paying while you were going to grad school, or did you? Because that was a really nice deal when I was in. They covered about seventy five percent while I was on active duty, which helped a lot. Yeah, the Navy is well. The military as a whole is really, really good about that, and especially current day, the military is very pro education, even for the enlisted men and women. A lot of people don't understand that. Historically, the difference between an officer in the military and an enlisted person in the military is that historically the officers had at least a four-year degree, mm -hmm. whereas current day, that's not the case anymore. In fact, when I was a platoon chief at SEAL Team 1, I had 14 enlisted SEALs, and when I inherited those boys, half of them already had a four-year degree. Awesome. And these were enlisted men. And by the time, you know, I finished with them, the rest of them had at least four-year degrees. So I was really fortunate that I had great mentorship when I was in the SEAL teams, master chiefs that harped on me all the time about making sure that I got my education knocked out prior to retiring. So I was really fortunate. The Navy paid for all of my education. Um, I didn't pay a single dime for my undergraduate degree at Asher University. And wow. then the Navy sent me to grad school at USC to get a master's in business, and they paid for that as well. Wow. And I actually wound up launching Vigilance Risk out of graduate school. I was going into the last semester of graduate school when I launched a company. So I got a lot of help from my entrepreneurship professors and my strategy professors when I was in grad school as I was standing this company up. And that was about 3.4 years ago. Wow, that is that's an awesome story. So your your transition out of military it sounds like it was a little easier than mine. And I went, I had it sort of backwards. I went to the fleet, and then uh, they tried to send me off to the desert, and I, so I went for uh, the ninety five forty five. So I ended up down at Lackland Air Force Base at the police school there. There you go. Came, but I got to stay in Hawaii, do a best, do a military police after that, and um, then I, I that was that was enough for me. Give me a sense of 
you know, how, how daunting it may have felt to get started in, with your own business, because that's quite a leap, you know, when um, you come out of the military and sort of everything's planned, everything's known what to do, um, except the mission of the day. Uh, you know, what was, that, what was that like for you to get that started up again? Or to, to just to, in, Honestly, in, to, yeah, to engage? Just starting out was, was easy. <laughs> and I, I can laugh at it now, you know, because knowing what I know now and the amount of stress I'm under on a daily basis now, it, it's totally laughable because going into entrepreneurship, I, I sort of had delusions of grandeur where I looked at it like, well, this is no different from mission planning. I'm going to build my con up. I'm going to plan for all the contingencies. I'm going to identify all the players are involved, make sure that the communications are set up so that everyone's going to know, and I'm just going to go. And I, I really went into entrepreneurship thinking that, okay, this is going to be maybe a little different, but no worries, I got this. Yeah, build so it, I, I went build it and they'll come. That every, everything is going to be fine and it's, it's going to be smooth sailing. And fast for 3.4 years, and I look back on that time and I laugh because I had no idea it was going to become as hard as it is. Welcome to the business world. So this is interesting to me because you, you pointed out that you, I, I believe you found a, a highly underserved market. Um, I talk to organizations on a constant basis that are very unprepared and don't understand the implications of what it is that you do and what it is that you bring to the table. And they absolutely gloss over em employee engagement and all these things that can become the beginning of workplace violence. Um, so how, how did you, is it, was that from your training that you knew that or did you identify that while you were in grad school as the sort of path you wanted to take your company down? So when I was building the business model canvas for Vigilance Risk when I was in grad school, I thought at the beginning that we were primarily going to be a service model company or a training company. Okay. We started immediately building active shooter response and awareness curriculums nice. because we identified that to be a huge pain in the market. But once we started actually closing contracts and gaining customers, our customers started asking us for more. And that caused myself and my two co-founders to look at one another and realize, hey, we've got a lot more to offer this problem than just training. Yeah. And that's when we actually moved forward with building out the threat and vulnerability arm of the company as well as the emergency planning arm of the company. And now we even have a blended model because we have web-based training for our customers as well. But the deeper I got into the research, the, the deeper I got into this business, the more I realized that Active shooter is just a very small piece of a massive problem. Workplace violence as a whole is the mountain and active shooter is really just the molehill. And as we started working with bigger customers, I really started to open my aperture a lot more and realize how these problems actually come to be the different types of workplace violence and like you were saying how each of them could have different tri triggers and, and therefore what we found is that in the market there are several companies that are, are working in this space of workplace violence mitigation but most of those companies are a jack of all trades which means that they can't master workplace violence mitigation. Mm -hmm. And that's why we decided that we were going to be extremely focused. But we also started to discover that in a lot of middle market and up, like bigger companies, a lot of those companies just went up so quickly that physical security was at the very bottom of the totem pole as they were building those companies out. And for obvious reasons, I can't blame them. When you're starting a startup company, you're worried about really important things like marketing and strategy and who's, who's going to lead sales and, and all this other really important stuff. And so a lot of these bigger companies are now playing catch up and that's where we help. Yeah, is there, um, do you, I, I'm just going to guess, I, give us a feel for the percentage of teams or groups that you walk into that have, I'll just say, zero policy around this particular question, be it physical security or, or, or workplace, uh, you know, violence mitigation, have they even begun? Um, you know, half of them have started, none of them have started. What's your, what's your take on the percentages you're seeing today? And maybe today versus a few years ago. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna be nice <laughs> when I say that currently today, I would say that it's still probably around ninety to ninety five percent of companies that don't really have anything in place. Yeah. Several years ago, I would say that number was closer to 99%. Mm -hmm. But currently, there's a lot of urgency in the market, especially here in the state of California, because primarily because of the active shooter threat. These mass shootings have gotten so out of hand yeah. that it's forcing the leaders of, of our, not just our country, but even down to the individual states to take a look at, hey, what are we doing in order to mitigate the risk of violence in the workplace? For example, in, here in California in April of 2018, Cal OSHA released a, an addendum to the general duty clause. It's, it's section 3342 of the general duty clause that states that any healthcare organization that has direct provider to patient contact annually is no longer a, a nice to have you are required to be aware of all of your, you're required to be aware of all of your organization's threats and vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. You also have to communicate with your employees regarding what those threats and vulnerabilities are because gross negligence is no longer going to be acceptable in a court of law. Annually, they also have to have a workplace violence prevention plan within their injury and illness prevention plan or an emergency operations policy that actually addresses workplace violence mitigation, and they have to provide interactive training to every employee regarding workplace violence mitigation. Well, following April 2018, we've seen how many more mass shooting events that have killed how many more people. We've seen Las Vegas, we've seen YouTube, we've seen San Antonio, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School down in Florida. They just keep happening. Therefore, that's caused Cal OSHA to go back to the table and start the discussion and the draft of the Addendum 3343, which will be an extension of 3342, mm -hmm. except this new addendum will cover general industry. Wow. So I think that really soon, possibly within the next 365 days here in the state of California, all companies, regardless of industry, regardless of size, number of employees, all companies will be required to, at a minimum, do those things annually in order to mit mitigate the risk of workplace violence. Yeah, and it, don't you think it's like for some reason a little too late? And it makes me sad that it took you know regulatory guidance or mandates from OSHA to do these things. Give us, uh, we're going to go take a break, pay a few bills. We'll be back in about one minute, and we're talking about workplace violence and mitigation, so hang around. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at three, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at three o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Security Matters Hawaii. We're talking with Ty Smith, and we're going through a professional's perspective on risk of, 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 of workplace violence mitigation. And a lot of companies, as we've discussed, really haven't taken steps, and from the top down, haven't taken the time to build policy, to put in procedures, to do the training. And so California has taken it upon themselves through OSHA, um, Occupational Self and Health, Safety and Health Association, to draft some legislation around this in the healthcare space. And Ty, you're thinking that's gonna flow right on down into the rest of industry, which I think we need. Absolutely, we do need that because 
the leaders of companies, regardless of the size of that company, regardless of how many employees you have or what industry you're in, leaders of people have to claim responsibility for the safety and security of the people that are working within their organizations. So I agree with you. It's a little la- it's a little sad that it takes. You know, the, the California Occupational yeah. Safety and, and, and Health Administration actually putting out guidance and, and requirements, but it's better late than never because this yeah. is something that we absolutely have to address, and we have to address it right now because what we see from the data that we're gathering is that it's not going away. Yeah. It's not increasing. When I say that it's not, I'm talking about the active shooter threat. Sure. Is it? so bad that people need to become paranoid or you know not do the things that they enjoy doing but we absolutely can no longer afford to ignore it yeah and you know on the on the government side we talk a lot about the insider threat and this insider threat whether it comes from someone who becomes disgruntled or someone's coerced them by payment um, the fact that you've got these workplace teammates who can allow another teammate to get so far out on the ledge or be under so much duress or so much rough, you know, without saying something, without offering some help. Because workers notice that their fellow workers acting different. He's having some troubles. And this is where this conversation has to start. You know, you, you'd like to see family engaged with family, but oftentimes today people are, aren't even working in the same city where the rest of their family is. And you may not know that they're disenfranchised. Um, what's your what's your take on that because i think the military was quite a bit better about taking care of your shipmates um in the workspace why do you think it's so different well i think that companies have to focus on and not just companies andrew companies schools uh, religious organizations we as a whole have to focus on the continuation of the development of interpersonal relationships. Yeah. We, we live in the day and, and age of technology where people would much rather talk to one another via email, chat yeah. boxes, and, and text than to actually have an in-person conversation with someone. Because we teach our customers that it's really difficult to notice especially right away, if one of your colleagues is deviating from their baseline behavior, if you never spend time actually talking yeah. to that person or those people. And that's really, really important. So first and foremost, we have to get back to talking to one another. We definitely have to become much more situationally aware. If you think about you know, when 9-11 happened in the United States, every American in this country was as situationally aware as a human being could possibly be. I mean, we were watching one another like hawks, but we have short-term memories. Yeah. And so we have to become a lot more situationally aware, mm. not paranoid, but just situationally aware of what's going on around us at all times. Who is around us? What objects are around me? Where am I right now? I'm going into a movie theater. Do I know where exits are? And again, it's not paranoia. It's just pulling your face away from your cell phone for even three (laughs) seconds, every 30 seconds, just to look around and see what's happening around you. Yeah, they they had to pass a law here that you can't use your cell phone when you're crossing the street because people would just walk out in the street and get run over. That's how bad that oh, that, I it. that habit's gotten. Yeah, it's actually there's a law against it now. So um, I wanted to touch on some things. So you're you know you're you're creating this um, training. You know you're, you're focused on 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 bringing this to people. And I know you guys are starting to develop some. I think it's like e-learning or is it remote where where you can send this training into an organization and then maybe come in and do some live work groups. Or how, how are you um, how are you deploying some of these solutions that you've developed? Yeah, so I'll answer that by telling you a little bit more about vigilance risk solutions. So we are a physical security and risk company that specializes in workplace violence mitigation. That's all we do. And we help our customers to mitigate the risk of workplace violence by way of building threat and vulnerability assessments. And so what that means is that we go into a, a customer's organization and we identify all of their physical, digital, environmental, 
and human vulnerabilities. And then we build a customer's emergency operations policy. We identify all of the threats and the vulnerabilities, and then we build strategies in order to mitigate the risk of those vulnerabilities becoming threats and those threats actually becoming violence. And that emergency operations policy is something that the customer can use to help stay to the left of boom and mitigate the risk of a violent scenario actually happening. But also, I think it's really important that I take a short sidebar here okay. and mention the fact that there is no such thing as prevention. So if you ever hear of a security professional or a company saying that, hey, we are going to prevent yeah. violence from happening within your organization, that's just not true because a motivated individual will find a way. Yes. So we help organizations to mitigate the risk of violence happening within that organization. So that emergency operations policy also serves as a playbook that the organization can use in the wake of a violent attack in order to get back to normal operations as quickly as possible. Mm. Because every day that that organization isn't operating the way it was designed to operate, that organization is losing money daily. Sure. So once we build the emergency operations policy, we then start looking at training the employees, training employees regarding what is in the emergency operations policy so that in the event of an incident, not only does the employee understand what leadership of that organization expects of them, but also the leadership knows what the employees are expecting of them. This is what we are planning to do in order to end this event and keep you safe and to help you recover from that event. So we train the employees regarding what's in the emergency operations policy. And this is why this is important, Andrew. Going back to the question you asked a couple of minutes ago, we, the companies that we find that, that do actually have a process or a policy built to address workplace violence, mm -hmm. chances are, once we track it down, it's got about five years of dust sitting on top of it, and we actually do this. We randomly pick employees, and we ask them, what's in your, your organization's emergency operations policy? Mm -hmm. And you can probably guess the number of employees that have no clue what we're talking about when we ask that question. So we train them on the emergency operations policy. Then we also train them regarding workplace violence mitigation. So we train courses like workplace violence uh, mitigation and awareness, active shooter awareness and response, corporate travel safety, things along those lines. And we do that training in person so okay. that employees actually get that interactivity. They get the ability to to ask questions of true subject matter experts. Our subject matter experts come from the highest qualified physical security, global security experts on the planet, from Navy SEALs all the way down to United States Secret Service agents, SWAT police officers. And then lastly, we have to ensure sustainment of the training. Yeah. And that's where our web-based training comes into play ah. because we want employees and students to have year-round unlimited access to this information so that they can also take ownership in their own safety and security. They shouldn't have to wait around for their boss to say, hey, it's that time of the year you need to do your, your web-based training for workplace violence. No, that is not enough. We want them to have unlimited access to this content so that they can be responsible for their own training and they can train as much as possible. Yeah, and we have a few minutes left, so I want to get your thoughts on one thing. We, we spend a lot of time in our organization teaching people how to have that difficult conversation. You know, that one that where you have to come to someone and say, hey, I, I, are you okay? You know, and, 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 and try to have that with some empathy and, and try to, there's, there's some skills, I think, in this interpersonal stuff that, that you mentioned that, uh, interpersonal relationship that I think we've sort of lost and so we spend time teaching there hoping that that's the the base of that is this something that you you bring in into the uh, training that you're giving as well as it start that low absolutely so especially within our workplace violence courses and our active shooter courses we have modules where we discuss human behavior and psychological and, and physiological indications of violence so that people learn how to read other people. For example, we talk about 
you know, a human being's eyes and how what a person is doing or failing to do with their eyes mm. can be an indication that something is amiss. Maybe that person isn't preparing for violence, but something is definitely wrong. For example, in the United States of America, it's, it's in our culture that if you're having a conversation with someone, you have, you practice eye contact yeah. with that human being. Whereas we know that if, if a person is refusing to make eye contact with you and you're already having a conversation that is an uncomfortable conversation, mm -hmm. chances are there's something off about that person. And again, it doesn't mean that that person is contemplating violence, right. just but having... that person is definitely showing you physically that their mind is moving somewhere else and, and they don't really want to have the conversation that they're having. And a good example of that is, think about it. For all of you out there that have kids, consider this. How many times have you asked your child a question and you already know the answer to that question and you look at him and you, so, and you say, hey, Timmy, did you take that cookie off the counter? And when Timmy goes to answer you and you know that he's not going to tell you the truth, where does he look? Does he look down at his feet as he says no or does he look at you in your eyes? So we go through those types of modules where we train individuals to understand human behavior and to be able to pick up on those, some of those verbal cues as well as those, those physical indicators like noticing if you're communicating with a person and that person's maybe closing off to you, folding their arms, or you see their hands are down at their sides, but instead of their hands being relaxed, their hands are clenched into this. Those are indicators that that human being is becoming really uncomfortable. And that's a really important thing that has to be taught when you're, talk, when you're talking about active shooter awareness and response and workplace violence mitigation. Yes, that's a fact. Interpersonal communication is where it starts. Workplace violence mitigation is possible. Get to work on it. If you don't know how to work on it, please reach out to Vigilance Risk Solutions. Ty Smith and his team can take care of you. They've got a lot of answers. Thank you so much because security matters. Aloha.